Welcome to the Bob Allen's HealthCast, episode number 303. Your insurance company plays doctor without a license. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. Dr. Maupin called me the other day and she said, quote, I'm mad as hell and I'm not taking it anymore. <laughs> and I said, uh, news, newsroom. Or yeah, that was that movie. Because we're trying to identify the movie. That, and she said, no, I'm not playing that game. I'm mad as hell and I'm not taking it anymore. I said, well, what are you mad about? She said, insurance companies. <laughs> so today, she's going to talk to you about her concerns about insurance companies and the way they operate and what makes her so furious on behalf of her patients. So, Basically. <laughs> It's all yours. I mean, the, the problem with insurance companies is what, what they were devised to be was a way to pay for, to put money in to a pot to pay for your medical care. That's right. what they were supposed to be. Right. And then they decided they were going to practice medicine. And you don't feel it and you don't necessarily know that, but behind the scenes, they're practicing medicine and, and they use certain ways of doing it with your doctor to get your doctor to do what they... To steer. To steer your doctor to a certain drug, to steer your doctor to a certain procedure, or to prevent your doctor from doing a procedure for you that you need and your doctor thinks you need, and they just say, we won't pay for it. That's how they manipulate your your doctor, or they make so much paper paperwork involved in getting something through right. that it is not economically possible for your doctor to do that work or hire someone to do that work to make you to make it so happen. Many layers of conversations to get approval if you ever do get that far, and they always put you on you hold. Don't have time to spend, right? You're on they, hold. You're on hours. hold. A doctor or one of my staff who would know enough to get something pushed through has to sit on hold for 20 minutes for each phone call. Now, why do they get to do that? I mean, it's not like they have highly trained people on the other end of the phone. They have secretaries in front of a t- in front of a computer screen with an algorithm saying, if they have done this, then they have to do this. If they've done this. Th-. So basically your medical care is really being run not by your doctor, but by your insurance company. And we're going to show you several things. I mean, I spent yesterday afternoon writing letters to the insurance company, and I don't even ta- I don't even sign up with them. They're, I don't work for them. I have, a ca- I have a cash practice because I don't trust them. And they're still invading my privacy and, and invading my patient's privacy and telling them what they can and cannot have, and they're practicing medicine. And it's my belief that if they're going to practice medicine in the state of Missouri or any state, that they should get licensed to practice medicine. Because, and who's letting them do this? I mean, we're letting them do this, but part of the reason is doctors don't have any pull and patients don't know what's happening. So this is to tell you what's going on behind the scenes. I had a client years ago that was suicidally depressed. I recommended a treatment plan. and I didn't take her insurance, but I agreed to fill out the paperwork that would help her insurance company make a determination of whether or not they would pay her for the treatment that mm-hmm. she was paying me for. But she's suicidally depressed. I fill out the treatment plan. I send it to her. The insurance company calls me and says, do you not understand that this woman has a lifetime cap for mental health treatment? This was before the law was changed. And I said, do you not understand that I don't care? I don't work for you. I work for her. She needs this treatment. And they said, well, we're not going to authorize it because she's got a lifetime cap and we have to balance over the course of her lifetime. Well, her lifetime well, will be short if she kills herself. That's what I said. That's exactly what I said. If she kills herself, <laughs> she'll never reach her lifetime cap. So let's worry about that problem in five years or 10 years if we can keep her alive. Right now, we want to keep her alive. And, they're, and they said, we're going to recommend that she go to a different, different therapist <laughs> who understands our protocols and is willing to work within them more so than you. Is she still alive? She's still alive. Oh, yeah. thank God. Yeah, she's still, but she's reached, uh, she didn't reach her lifetime cap because the law changed, and now they, they can't have one. That's right, and thank God. So, so every once in a while, we get a lot of change. Right. I mean, some of these things that were so bizarre with insurance where they 
didn't, they um, held up our payments for like six months. So doctors yeah. were going out of business. Counselors were going out of business because you can't wait six months after a baby's born. Well, they wait six months and then they send your forms back and say, you didn't fill in line 16. Right. So we're starting the clock again. Right. Another you have six 30 months. days to respond. And when you respond, then it starts our six month clock again. So they might not pay you for a year. But they repealed that right. back in the right. late 1990s when yeah. that was my bill. That was one of my bills that kept them from doing that. And they have to pay interest to us if they hold us up past 90 days. It was a bill that you helped work through the Missouri State Legislature. Mm -hmm. I actually wrote it yeah. and pushed it through the Missouri State Legislature. Right. I had to go down and testify and everything. Right, right, so right. sometimes yeah. we can do this, but this is so pervasive. It's kind of out of my hands unless this this health, health cast goes anywhere and somebody who really can do something about it can see it. But what they will deny your medicine, okay? Or they will say you should take a different medicine. So I have a, I have a patient who has diabetes. I've tried him on two different, I mean, I, I replace his hormones, but he'd like me to manage his diabetes. So I've tried him on two different medications and he can't take them there. It makes him deathly ill. And he's a physician. I mean, he has to work. He, he can't have high blood sugar because it makes him goofy or it makes him not feel good. And it's not good for him. That's diabetes. And he can't take the medicine. It's a medical term. There's no, a I mean, it makes him feel not at the top of his game, which you want your doctor to be. And so we've gone through two medications. I sent in a prescription for the third, which I'm sure would work, but his, then I get a letter back. We won't approve this. You have to try them on one of three, these three medications for diabetes that I've never heard of. I don't know why they want me to use these other medications. They might do the same thing. They might not. I don't know. I don't have a track record with these medications, but they're not going to pay for his medication. So that I want him to have. Unless you use what they tell you to use. But I've got to put him through three more months of things not working. Potentially. And, potentially. Right. And then I can try the other drug. I also have to document it. I have to recall them. I have to send in more information about his intolerance to this next drug. So I had to then talk to him. So, so I've gotten the letter. I've read it. I don't know exactly what he would want to do. I have to then talk to him and say, which way do you want to go? He said, well, okay, we'll do it their way. So he's going to do it their way for three months and see, but I find this to be them practicing medicine. They even told me what drug to write. I mean, what more and does, try, and try can to, I say to say that they're practicing medicine? And trying to spend time talking to them and working your way through the bureaucratic layer and then talking to him. Right. That's clock time for you. It is. You're not seeing patients because they're sitting out in the lobby waiting on you and you're waiting on the phone call to be answered so that right. you can take care of the needs of this one patient. Mm -hmm. And then they're stymieing that by layers of interference. You know, And so the ultimate message to you is, if you want to go and work with your patients, then you just need to do what we tell you. Right. And, and, and that's what most doctors will do because they're so overwhelmed. Help. Right. And I usually don't pre-cert any medications, but this was so egregious mm -hmm. for me to, to be told what drug to use that I found that just, I mean, I had to at least address it. Right. And ask him what to do. So, so offensive. It's, it is offensive. So so that, was, that wasn't that was a ton of time, but that's my time that I could be spending with patients. And it's illegal to practice medicine without a license in this state and in every other state. If you open an office and said, y'all come on in, I'll treat you, you get arrested you go to and jail. you go to jail. But the insurance companies can do it, and they do it through the methodology of payment. You can do that. We just won't pay for it. And so... Americans have to get their mindset changed about what insurance represents to them and how the insurance game is played. Because if you think, oh, I've got insurance, I'm okay. If something comes up, I'm covered. You are probably not covered because the insurance company's job is not to pay for your illnesses or your medicines. It's to make money. I always laugh when they say, we're there for your health. Yeah. They're not there for your health. No, they're, they're, they're just, they're a bank basically, and they should be giving you the money that you've put in mm -hmm. that you need when you're ill. And they're not. They, they've way out, out, jumped out of their bounds. They make huge profits, and they've taken the money out of medicine, and they have 
given it to themselves. So yes, I believe in the free market, but this isn't really a free market. They've been given all kinds of dispensations by the government, so they can do this. And they allow a lot of drugs to come through that are very expensive. They cut a deal, you know, so with this one drug so that they can use that one drug and they tell us what to do and use that drug. And that company, of course, will drop its price and let us get the drug at a reasonable amount. That, that in one way, seems like capitalism, but, but because they're doing that and choosing the drug you're supposed to take, everybody's supposed to take, because it's cheaper, that doesn't sound like capitalism to me. I mean, that sounds like socialism mm -hmm. or Big Brother telling us what to do. But I've got an even worse story. Okay, I, I, I mean, thought you did. So yesterday, you know, yesterday was kind of like one chart after another going, oh, my gosh, this is terrible. Right. What could they do to patients again, more than this? You know, so I have a patient who, as a, a preteen, had a brain tumor right in the center and right at his pituitary gland. And he had to undergo surgery. And if that wasn't bad enough, radiation of the brain. And so, so it saved his life, which is wonderful. Medicine saved his life. But it destroyed part of his pituitary gland, which means sometimes it destroys one part, another, you know, but his part of his pituitary gland that doesn't work anymore is the stimulation of the testicles to make testosterone the stimulation of the thyroid to make thyroid hormone and the stimulation and the growth hormone that comes from the pituitary gland. So when he was, when he was being taken care of, he's now 30 something. When he was being taken care of as a young man, he'd see a group of doctors at a children's hospital and would be evaluated. And they'd say, yeah, you're, you're hitting puberty. We'll give you some testosterone. Well, they gave him t little tiny doses not enough for a teenage boy because they have very high levels. And he, so he felt a little better, but they didn't give him growth hormone because they just forgot, I guess. So Well, he, because the government regulates the use of growth hormone right. so severely that it's problematic. And it's the same in issue you're case, having with, with insurance companies. Right. In his case, though, he needed it. they approve it for children, mm -hmm. and he would have been approved. They just didn't go through they the didn't. process because it is an onerous process to get it approved. And they were doing a triage. Right. They were looking at, you know, he's got a brain tumor. We've got to save his life right now. Mm -hmm. Down the road, he'll need growth hormone. But they never got down the road with him. Right. And he said that. He said to me, they never gave me growth hormone, and I'm 4'10". And that's grown not man. good. Four a grown man, 4'10". And he had the epiphyses when they did his epiphyses at 13. The end of his bones said that his he would be 6' tall. Oh, wow. So, So he knows that. Right. And he doesn't gripe about it, and he doesn't complain about it. He just told it to me just like a story, like his story. And then, so we talked for a very long time, and I said, mm, so what happened after that? He goes, I gave up on testosterone because they wouldn't give me enough to make me feel right. I never felt right. I don't feel normal. I don't, my brain doesn't work very well. His cholesterol's high. All these, he has all the symptoms of low testosterone, and it's like under 100 yeah. And it should be 400 and above at his age, probably 800. So this, he was under dose. So he comes to me pretty much out of desperation. And he knows that he's going to have to pay my office because we don't mess with insurance. I would have to hire five other people for my office and prices would have to go up for me to take insurance. And then they'd never pay for it. Plus you don't want insurance companies sitting on your shoulder directing your care. No, but they're still doing they're it. They're trying to. Yeah. So, um, but they're, they're, now they're sitting on the patient's shoulder. Right. They said, well, we're not going to pay for this. Right. And so the, in this case, we treated him. We gave him all the paperwork. We gave him the letter of necessity. We gave him everything to send to his insurance company for reimbursement. And they send me a letter saying we're not paying for it. Mm -hmm. We don't have enough information, even though they have all the chart and everything else. So... This gentleman probably won't come back to me if he can't get it paid for, and he's starting to feel better, and I fixed his thyroid, and, I, and I'm looking at his growth hormone later. I'll look at that to see if we can do something to stimulate it, not give him growth hormone, but to stimulate the production right. of it on his own, because that's not, that's not a criminal act by the government. Something like pregnenolone? Well, we could, yeah, he could use some pregnenolone, and we can do that. I just want to see what the testosterone would do. This was only a, a few months ago. Mm -hmm. But um, 
But no, that what I was thinking of is using um, sermorelin, which is a stimulation for the pituitary to make the growth hormone. Okay. So that was that was my thought in in his pro, in his treatment plan. Yet I get this. We're not going to pay for it, and we because it's not it's bioidentical. We don't pay for bioidenticals. We don't you know. They, they had all kinds of reasons they weren't going to pay for this gentleman, and he needs a break. I mean, he's already had all kinds of, of um, roadblocks in his care. He needs to feel normal. And if this, this is making him feel normal, then he needs to have it paid for by his insurance. Why else would you pay for insurance? Seriously. So, it's so, a magical rabbit's foot. So it's yes, the same reason people don't throw away medicines. They don't finish the, the medicine. They put it in the medicine cabinet, and they say just they might ever use need it. it someday. You know? Well, I can do that because I'm a doctor. I know how to use it. <laughs> but if other people do that, they don't know exactly how to use it, and it might go bad in the meantime. So. Right. But it's magical thinking. Uh huh. That's right. Keeps them forgetting. I'm safe. safe. I've got insurance. <laughs> I'm safe. Yeah. Well, you well, are. The insurance company says, you know what? You should be happy to be alive. You don't have any right to feel good. Mm hmm. It's what they're essentially mm -hmm. saying to this guy. Right. And we don't we don't have any responsibility for helping you feel better. Helping you feel better. Right. So so I wrote a pretty scathing letter back to them mm -hmm. and what he had gone through and what he needed. And I couldn't imagine that they would do this to this gentleman. I'm sending a copy to him, sending right. a and I'm saving a copy to send to a state rep if I have to. You know, if right. block his name out and then send the send the situation or to the um, or to the state insur state insurance state board of commission. insurance. Right. Although they're on, they're all they're all populated by insurance guys, right. so they're not going to come out board. on my side right. or on the patient side. They're really instead of working for the patient, which they should be, they're all insurance guys. They're on the side of insurance. Right. So why should I even think that they're going to help? Well, me you with just that? have to keep trying. So that's that's another that's yet another thing. When I was practicing um, OBGYN during the last year, I did GYN. Um, I love doing surgery. Surgery is very therapeutic for me because instead of having to watch someone get better over months and years, I could fix them, and they would be better when the, you know in six weeks. It was like right. a miracle. Right. You know, it was it was so much more rewarding somebody was ble if a woman was immediately, bleeding to death immediately gratifying right and yeah. it was somebody who's bleeding to death we take out her uterus she would stop bleeding to death and if right. someone had terrible pelvic pain afterwards they hardly ever even took pain medicine because they were in less pain after surgery right. than they were before so right. it was very gratifying and when i first started practice in 1985 the fee to do a an abdominal hysterectomy through an incision was Thirty five hundred dollars. That's what you charge the patient. That's what that's what the insurance company would pay, would pay for. Pay you, okay. Pay me, okay. Right. Thirty five hundred dollars. So this is nineteen eighties. The dollar's gone down in value, basically, and um, everything's more expensive by now by a lot. So that's what my payment was for each hysterectomy. So over the years, they just kept dropping the fee. So instead of going up with cost of living, they dropped the fee, dropped the fee, dropped the fee because managed care came in and said, we don't want hysterectomies. So we're going to drop the fee for doing a hysterectomy so low, no doctor will do one. And that's where we are today. And the year that I did GYN, mm -hmm. they had dropped the fees on every female procedure so low that I could work every Monday of the calendar and still not make enough operate all day right. that I could not pay for the malpractice insurance, <laughs> which isn't a lot. It was like extra ten thousand dollars just to operate. Right. So that over a year, I couldn't even pay for that for the money that I received by doing surgery every Monday. So when you lose money doing something as a physician, you stop doing it. Right. And I gave up surgery. Well, it's like the insurance companies are running a lottery. They say to all the doctors, who will do this procedure for $400 or and who will do it for $375? Well, but, but they don't want us to do the procedure because if you do the procedure, they, you know, they have it's not cost. about us. Right. We're making the decision. So they want to drop it below right. what we can do. So the hospital has to, has to get paid mm -hmm. and the floor on the hospital has to get paid. I mean, the operating room and the floor have to get paid. So if I don't do the surgery, they don't pay for any of that. 
Right. They save themselves twenty or thirty thousand mm-hmm. dollars or less. I mean, they may have a deal with the hospitals too, but still. Well, you know they do. That's but but doctors can't do what they can't afford. So Medicare decided on a different physician. Had Medicare decided to decrease the fee that they would pay a doctor for a medication that gets injected into joints. Okay, and a lot of older people get this. When they when their joint fluid goes down, right. they in, inject this particular medication. So Medicare decided, in their wisdom, to decrease what they'll pay a doctor because the doctor has to in, bring any injection doctor has to pay for, bring it in his office, receive that money back plus whatever it costs for the cost of money sitting there, mm-hmm. and then charge the patient, and then the insurance company should pay for that. Right. Well, they decreased. What they would pay for this particular injection drug mm-hmm. by half of what it costs the doctor. Okay? No doctor can do that because it costs twelve hundred dollars and they would pay six hundred. No doctor is gonna do a procedure where they lose six hundred dollars if they so, know. So what happens then? Is they don't do it. They don't do it, and and then patients end up having to have a knee replacement, which is a fifty thousand dollars surgery. Maybe, or they, or they live but in pain. even if they give up, right? A couple, a couple of them just give up and live in right. pain, right? Because they they're afraid of surgery or they can't have surgery, right? Then they the insurance company wins again. Any time you're denied, they win, right? Any time a surgery is denied, they win. I would have a surgeon who was. Who wasn't a surgeon? I'd have a medical director who was a medical doctor telling me I couldn't do a hysterectomy on somebody. So, in effect, you're saying that accountants and clerks and computer programmers are making your medical decisions. Right. So, so they don't have a license to practice medicine. They don't know you. They've never touched you. And they don't know about the medicine. And they they don't know about medications that you take except what it costs. And they want you to not get it. The less medication you're on, the better to them. So at the end of the day, the reason we're having this conversation is in some ways just to vomit. But in other Not ways, really. Is, I mean, people need to, to know this to is happening. Because you need to do something about it. But what do you want them to do if they're faced with these situations? What's helpful? My my thought would be that that you can write your state rep. The federal government can't do a whole lot, but you could write the, right you know, both. your Congress, yeah, you yeah Congress people, yeah. and tell them your situation and what was denied you or how they were practicing medicine. And you can also take that same letter, you can copy it, you know, co- send it with different headings to all these people, different people, and then send it to the Board of Healing Arts in your state. And put it on social media. Yeah. If you're in Facebook, if you're in Instagram, if you're in Twitter, start telling your story about the problem that you ran into with the insurance company well, this, or the authorization. My 31 year old. I mean, I don't have a problem with saying who did this. I mean, this is a blue cross company that said no to him and the, and the, um, and the medication for the physician that they told me what to do. This is interesting. At the very top of the page, everything's in like Japanese and Chinese. Oh, so I, I yeah. want to know, is that where you are now? Yeah. Because I don't know where they are, but it's from United Healthcare. So everybody's involved <laughs> in this All type of activity. Interest. Yeah. And Medicare's involved in this. So this is a huge problem and you're going to be at their mercy if you get sick. And if you're going to be at their mercy if you have a drug that costs a lot that you need and you can't get because guess what? You can't even go outside the United States and get it. It's a crime. So you need to write your state legislature in terms of saying insurance companies are practicing medicine in my state without a license, and you, you as the legislature ought to regulate that. And you need to contact the federal legislature in terms of saying th- there's an ongoing conversation about the ability of drug manufacturers to set their price for the drug. They can set it anywhere they want. Today it's $100, tomorrow it's 5000 because we can get it. And so there are conversations that are being had whenever Congress is in session <laughs> which, which it often is not, 160 days a year, uh, about this, and you need to weigh in. Contact your legislature, let them know how you feel, let them know what you think, and let them know that you vote and you're informed. And send the copy of your denial letter. If your doctor has it, they can give it to you. Right. But send the copy of your denial letter or all your denial letters. Like I have lots of denial letters on my charts. Right. You know, so just send, and most people can just press a button and send it. So we began by saying we're mad as hell. We're not going to take it anymore. 
What we hope is that you feel the same way and that you will take productive steps to solve the problem, not just complain and not just roll over and die. Thank you. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.